I did something kind of surprising this year. At age 62, I volunteered to be a small group leader in youth group, and I'm so enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought, God, you probably want me to volunteer to do something that I'm really uncomfortable at. <laughs> so here we go. But I love it. I love it. And uh, orchestra was awesome. Oh my goodness, that was something. I, I am so thankful for how they prepare me to preach and how I get to worship. Um, I, am, I live a life of being interrupted. That's just really my job. I, I'm, I, and that's what God has called me to do. It, there's that phone call, that uh, text, that uh, whatever it may be, and suddenly the life changes and I have to redirect my course and I'm ministering wherever it may be that God has called me. That is just what I do. And... Uh, but I, I, sometimes they're terrible interruptions. Sometimes they're awful, and sometimes they're beautiful uh, interruptions. I, I want to show you one of my favorite ones from this summer. I'd gone with Tim. Tim's way back there. Wave your hand, Tim. And I, I, he, he, we met up in Montana, and we went to Glacier National Park, and we went hiking, and then we, we went backpacking back uh, up over the Triple Divide Pass into this beautiful region down there. And one morning, woke up, and this was walking in the lake in front of where our tent was at. Isn't that awesome? A moose. It, and we had seen grizzly. We had seen uh, well, about probably 100 bighorn sheep, mountain goats. But here comes this majestic moose. And then uh, we're taking down our tents and I hear this sound. Crunch, crunch, crunch. And then this happens. It's like coming to me, right? It's like 10 feet away. And then this, I want to show you this video. Isn't that awesome? This creature, there's Tim right there. Uh, I'm, we're taking our tent down. We took our tents down, had breakfast. It was still hanging out with us for an hour or so. It was incredible. God's creation is wonderful. His interruptions, I hope you stop and look at a sunset. I hope you stop and look at a sunrise. I hope you pick up a baby and when he or she smiles at you, you adore that miracle. Let life interrupt you. Now, um, many years ago, I was a pastor at a small church in Parma, Michigan. I was a Baptist minister. And I was very uncomfortable in my role uh, ministering to that church, struggled with it. And uh, one day, one of the bright points in our church, a, a man uh, I dearly loved, suddenly passed away. I got a phone call from the, the, ho the hospital chaplain. Her name was Marcy. She was a, a Catholic nun. And she calls me up and tells me to come to the hospital. This terrible thing had happened. And I go to the hospital and minister into that situation. I get a phone call that very next week from Marcy, the hospital chaplain. And she says to me, Tim, and I was just a young guy in my 20s. You got a gift. And I want to help you develop it. Now, I hope you're looking at those that are coming behind you and seeing what God could do through the Marcy, the Catholic nun, changed my life by what she saw. She said, I'm an instructor through a University of Michigan Med Center in their pastoral clinical care program, I could get you in, I could train you, and you could work with me. I would like that. And then I, I accepted that role. I, I was trained with Marcy. I, I spent hours and hours walking shifts with her. And then later on, she would spend hours and hours walking with me. And then she released me to do uh, past pastoral care. Primarily, I did, uh, we all had our own significant role, but I did family notification, crisis intervention, um, all that terrible stuff. <laughs> That's what I handled. And, uh, uh, and I am so thankful for that. I, uh, Marcy, by the way, I, I have to tell you this story because she's now in heaven. Uh, well, there was four of us chaplains that worked for that center. And um, one was Harvey, he was a Presbyterian minister whose wife had passed away. And Brenda, who was a pastor at a uh, African uh, Methodist Episcopal church. I always get that name a little mixed up. And all of us worked together. We had different roles. One day, Marcy, the Catholic nun, calls me up and says, Harvey and I want to talk to you. And I normally assume the worst. I wish I didn't do this. I'm like, oh, they're mad at me. Yeah, you know. And they sit down with me and they go, Tim, 
been really obvious to you, hasn't it? I'm like, no. Why? Why? What are you talking about? Tell me. Well, about me and Harvey. And that's when your brain goes into gear, like, what? Is it? It's not about the hospital. And she says, and then I suddenly struck, well, Harvey does show up early and leave late. And, oh, I mean, this is a sudden, like, in, in, and we're in love, and we want to get married, and the Catholic priest won't do it. Would you do our wedding? I'm like, the Baptist minister, we're doing the wedding for the Presbyterian minister and the Catholic nun. <laughs> That's a good idea. Let's do that. So I did. Marcy uh, got cancer later on, and when she was passing away, she drove up here to Traverse City to see me and say goodbye. And uh, she was with Harvey. And I remember uh, her meeting me in um, open space downtown Traverse City, and she says, Tim, come back to Jackson and take over. And I go, I can't. God's got me doing something right here in this place. It's very similar to what a chaplain would do in a hospital setting. Um, she's in heaven, and I'm thankful for that and thankful for how she affected me. One of the things I did was family notifications at that hospital. And when I watched a family at the hospital, I was often that guy who came to see them and was about to tell them the worst news they had ever heard. And I saw every kind of possible reaction. I believed that within 30 seconds, oftentimes, I could tell if I was talking to a Christian. In conflict, in sorrow, when that sudden knock came on your door, do you rage? Swear? Attack out? Act out? I saw at the hospital about every kind of reaction. Cursing, swearing. I had a fist once that just floated right by my face. And it was terrible news. I watched helplessly as a young man smashed the hospital waiting room to bits. Broke everything in it. I remember once uh, there was a Chinese family in Detroit. Edison had uh, large offices there in Jackson, Michigan, and uh, they had exchange electrical engineers from China. And this Chinese fellow came in with a heart attack, and he passed away, and they called me as a chaplain because they didn't have a Chinese interpreter. And they wanted me to tell somehow to his wife and two teenage sons that he had passed away. And I am there, and I cannot think of one Chinese word and, or how to help, right? And I could only think of, come with me. And we walked back into that ER room where her beloved husband lay there dead. And I don't know what to do at this moment. I'm completely, I'm normally somewhat awkward, but I was really awkward at that moment. And, uh, and... I look at her, this little Chinese lady, and I say, do you want to pray? I'm putting up the prayer symbol. This woman grabs my hand. The two teenagers get into a circle, one holding my hand, and they hit the floor, and they are praying. Now, I don't know Chinese, but I know who they were talking to. <laughs> and they were weeping, and they were pouring out their broken hearts to God. I had come across Chinese believers right here in America on the worst possible day of their life. I've been a bearer of terrible news. Fatal shootings, suicides, fatal accidents, end of life diagnosis, fatal heart attacks, birth loss. The list goes on and on, endless. Daniel had that knock at the door. How did Daniel respond with grace and quiet confidence? 
Why didn't he rage at the injustice? Why didn't he curse God and his friends? Why didn't he put his fist through that captain of the guard's face? Because he was only going to kill him later on, right? I contend that there's three reasons. He had a sacred history. He had sacred relationships. And he had sacred truth that enabled him. First, let's start with sacred history. Uh, the first chapter of Daniel, we get to see the, the four teenagers dare to be truly uh, uh, courageous young men of faith. They were willing to be tested. They, they resolved that they would not be defiled by the king's food. And these four young men emerge victorious. The cost was living on vegetables, Uh, Not the king's food, but the blessing was another victory to their sacred history, which would prepare them for more victories yet to come. Uh, I also contend that you could probably go back to Judah and that they had godly parents and that they probably had godly grandparents. And both of those people were part of the remnant because there was such a pagan thing going on back in Judah. Faithlessness was happening everywhere, but not Daniel's parents and his grandparents. He had a sacred history. I want to go to a different biblical character, David. Remember David's argument to Saul about why he could take on Goliath? Send me after this mighty warrior. I'll tell you why. Because he had killed what? The the bear, and the, the lion. He had already been battle-tested. If Daniel's fighting resume was, I, Saul, I have taken on the mouse and the chipmunk. Right? <laughs> Goliath would have crushed him. You don't begin with the big battle. New Hope's staff has some long-term sacred history. I've been here for 21 years. Pastor Craig was here before me. Uh, Pastor Rick has been here a long time. There's sacred history, and we've been through a lot of brokenness and joy and struggle together. And, And that's how you learn to serve the kingdom of God. My key life verses are Isaiah 48.10, and it goes back to my motorcycle accident. The first one is Isaiah 48.10. It goes like this. You have refined me, but not as silver. You've tried me in the furnace of affliction. God, you've changed me in affliction. Psalm 119.71 is another one I claim. It was good for me to be afflicted, so I might learn your decrees, O Lord. And I claim them over and over and over again. I have a quote from one of my favorite writers, Gary Thomas. A heavyweight boxing champion who dodges all serious contenders and consistently fight marshmallows is derided and ridiculed, and rightly so. Christians who dodge all serious struggle and consistently seek to put themselves in whatever situation and relationships are easiest are doing the same thing. They are coasting, and eventually that coasting will define them and even worse, shape them. Gary Thomas. Marshmallow fighters will be crushed by the next knock on the door. Daniel was battle tested and ready for the knock. Another important quote by the very same guy. Our Lord God has sovereignly ordained that our refining process take place as we go through difficulties not around him. The Bible is filled with the examples of those who have overcome as they pass through the desert, the Red Sea, the fiery furnace, and ultimately the cross. God doesn't protect Christians from the problems. He helps them walk victoriously through the promise. Gary Thomas. That's sacred history. Next, we need sacred relationships. I want to contend loudly. It's not good for us to fight the difficulties, the pains, and the sorrows of this life alone, and we are not meant to. We need each other. It says, Daniel, after the knock on the door, where does he go? He goes to his friends, right? Pastor Craig asked you, 
who are those three friends that you would call that asked to pray for you? I just want to go to a different story, but in the New Testament. Remember the story of, uh, it, it happened in Capernaum. By the way, every time I say the word comparative, I smile because I was there. Mike and I were there together. Uh, it, it's such a beautiful place. You two were there, sweetheart. This. And, and, and we were there in Capernaum. And, um, and it's such a beautiful seaside town in Galilee. And that's the place where the four friends uh, took their friend to Jesus. They came. The crowd was immense. They went up on the roof. They knocked a hole in the roof. And they let their friend down to Jesus. So here's my question, and I want you to text them, call them, and thank them. And I want you to use this quote. Who, but first of all, ask the question, who are your faith-filled, roof-smashing, hard-working, do-anything-for-you friends that will carry your broken body to Jesus? Call them up and say, hey, thank you for being my faith-filled, roof-smashing, hard-working, do-anything-for-me friend that will carry my broken body to Jesus if you needed to. We need those kind of friends. First service didn't get this one. It's time for a Lord of the Rings quote. Any Lord of the Rings fans? I was embarrassed for the first service. (laughs) Sam is talking to Frodo. You're going to finish this. I can't carry the ring, but I can. Amen. Amen. We need that kind of friend. Here's a quote for our time. And it's a different movie. Let's see if anybody can get it. It's an insane reel, but in it there's one sanity, the loyalty of old friends. Where's that? Ben Hur. Thank you. My wife thinks I'm obscure sometimes. The Bible says, go to the house of mourning and learn. And I have been part of many, many, many funerals. One lesson learned is the power of friendship at those places. We need each other in life. I have a picture. We're golfing together one week. Remember the good times. A month later, one of us is gone. And we're weeping together. That's why we need friendship. Because we don't know what's around the corner, but we know who will be there, God, in our friendship. To change it a little bit here, I am a grandfather. Put up this picture. Ella D. There she is. She's three years old. I was hanging out with her the other day, and you know how when you're preparing a message, everything goes with your message? And we were watching Frozen. (laughs) All right. Here's a quote. Some people are worth melting for. Olaf, you're my philosopher. Some people are worth forgiving, weeping together with, laughing together with, golfing together with, hiking together with, praying together with, talking together with, listening to together with, dancing together with, eating together with, having a Bible study together with. The list is endless. And I want to conclude, because I have these kind of friends. Some people are worth spending your entire life with. Some of my, as you see, favorite friendship quotes come from movies. You'll all get this one. Remember, George? No man is a failure who has friends. What's the movie? It's a Wonderful Life. Now, a quote from Henry Nouwen, who I love to read. When we honestly ask ourselves which person is our, our life means the most to us, we often find that it is those 
who instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. This is a friend who cares. We need each other. The times right now seek to break us apart. Cultural wars want us to take sides and divide us. But we must be united under one banner. Jesus. One more quote from hanging out with my granddaughter. See who gets this one. (laughs) Good friends will help you until you're unstuck. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh. That's right. (laughs) He was stuck in that hole. I've seen it with my own eyes recently. The church helped Kim and I after my motorcycle accident for years till we got unstuck. A few more friend thoughts from Daniel. In the prayer of thanksgiving, Daniel includes his friends. At the end of it, he says, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what it's easy to miss. We ask for of you. Seek not to be lifted up by your friends. Praise your friends. I also am going to jump to the end of the chapter here. Pastor Craig, by the way, will be back next week, and he will speak on the dream and the interpretation. Do not miss that. But King Nebuchadnezzar gives Daniel honor and great many gifts, and man, he just, he went from, well, he, he, he went from just the junior prophet to the boss. But Daniel doesn't leave his friends behind. He doesn't say, hey, it was great while I had you. Goodbye, I'm moving on. Like some kind of crazy, crazy rock singer. No, he moved, he moved into his bright new future with them. Verse 49, Daniel made a request to the king of uh, king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. Bless your friends. We can do greater things together for the kingdom than we could do alone. One last thought on this is there's no sacred relationships without sacred history. I want to give you a formula. Time plus life equals sacred relationships. They take time. If you could stand for a moment, and we're going to read the prayer because the last point is sacred truth. We're going to read it together. Craig quoted it. And I wish I could do that in front of you. But now that I'm in my 60s, I don't remember as well. So we're going to read it together. (laughs) Let's start. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells within him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. You can be seated. I just want to make a few points. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Name some names of God. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. What was that? I don't know. I think I heard that. Keep going. Yes, keep going. Yahweh. King of kings. Lord of lords. Yeah. 
Well, I, I just sat down and wrote out a bunch of them really quickly here. Daniel knew God. Here we go. I want to wrote out what just came out of my brain. Our Father who art in heaven, uh, Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, El Shaddai, King, Creator, Holy One, Redeemer, Rock, I Am, Abba, Emmanuel, the Almighty, Alpha and Omega, uh, author and finisher of our faith, deliverer, Lord of all, Mighty One, our hope. Do you know him? Yeah. All right. If you don't, let me introduce you. It's the most sacred relationship that you need. Amen. If you, when the, when the call comes, when the knock on the door happens, I promise you this, the God who never leaves you or forsakes you will be right there. To whom belong wisdom? James 1.5, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all. Daniel knew that God's wisdom is vastly superior to human wisdom. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Daniel knew that God's might is greater than all the weapons of mankind. Deuteronomy 10.17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God. I love to quote Zephaniah. Zephaniah, one of my favorite verses. The Lord your God is in our midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. This is the God we have who's mighty and in our presence. He changes times and seasons. A picture of God's faithfulness. We believers look at every sunrise, sunset, birth, season change as our faithful God arriving again and again. But this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. It says in there he removes kings and sets up kings. I'm so thankful for that truth. One thing Daniel knew that he would survive Babylon. That he knew that his God was there before Babylon and when Babylon is dust, his God would still be there. That is true with any king, president, dictator, or mogul. When they get their last ride in a long black hearse, the living God will still be in charge. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him forever. There is no mystery to God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge, God, how unsearchable are his judgment, how inscrutable are his ways. There are no secrets to God. What if you, uh, what if you need wisdom? We already mentioned he gives generously to you of this deep, deep well of wisdom. Now here's a question I have to ask. Who are you asking for help? Are you scrolling Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to find your needed answers? No miracles there, huh? Are you getting counsel from people who don't know Daniel's wise and mighty God? Are you letting angry, bitter, unforgiven, broken individuals fill your soul with selfishness and rage? In the words of Pastor Rick, stop it. <laughs> Go to God, the source of might and wisdom, who is ready to reveal to you the light of his loving, powerful truth. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm praying. I'm praying the following things. In this crowd, in this group of people, there are some people that are about to give up their sacred history. 
And whether that sacred history is a marriage, a relationship, or whatever it may be, dear Lord, I pray that it prolongs, that you heal it, that you nurture it, that you provide for it. We pray for sacred history. We thank you for sacred history. We thank you that you, our heavenly God, have been there for us, are there for us, and will be there for us. And we thank you for that. Dear Lord, I'm praying over this group of people, the blessing of sacred relationships. I'm thankful for mine. Dear Lord, I would not be standing up here. I would not be continuing in the ministry. I would not be uh, seeking the face of God without some friends that have stood right beside me and have been there all along. They have loved me in my broken moments, in my sad moments. They have forgiven me. They, when I spoke foolish things, they let that go, but they spoke the truth into me. Dear Lord, I thank you for friends that have been iron that sharpens iron. I thank you that I've had a confessional community, dear Lord, and I pray for that, dear Lord, that we can confess our sins one to another so that we might be healed. So I pray the blessing of sacred history and sacred relationships over this group. And I pray, finally, the, the gift, the mighty gift of sacred truth. Dear Lord, you are the source of truth. You are the pillar of truth. And we want to come to your word as the source of truth. Dear Lord, Satan is the father of lies and we reject his lies. But dear Lord, may we be overflowing with your truth. May our cup be filled up and may we seep out joy and love and life because we have filled it with you and you alone. In your mighty name, amen. Thank you for joining us as we have opened the scriptures once again to Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2, and we have heard about sacred history, sacred re relationships, and sacred truth. Think of it, sacred history. Some of you have walked with God a very long time, like 40 years. Others of you, like 14 days. I think of a young man recently I talked to here at New Hope who came into church on a Sunday with one intention, what he didn't know is that the God of the universe wanted to meet with him, and he gave his life to Jesus 14 days ago and began his journey. And perhaps that's some of you. And today, you need to bow a knee and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and begin your sacred history. Others of you, sacred relationships. Boy, the importance of small group communities that Daniel had as three companions, and some of you need companions to journey with. Uh, we continue to urge you to get connected in small group ministry, whether in person or online. We do have Zoom groups available, four right now that meet weekly. Others will be added as we have need or opportunity. So let us know on the connect card that you wanna join. And of course, as the sermon talked about sacred truth, building a life on a biblical foundation of who God is and what God has done. Well, make sure you join us next week for the conclusion of Daniel chapter 2 as Daniel moves from confusion to confidence, knowing that God is in charge of all of human history. Until next week, I'm Craig Treeweiler, your pastor, child of God, with this reminder, you are loved.